points the mind in the right direction. All right, let's let's go toward Krishna. <laughs> That's the intelligence, and then the mind. Is this for Krishna? That for Krishna? If it's not, I reject it. And the intelligence keeps the mind on track. What's that uh, illustration in the, in the front of the Gita? The chariot. The mind is the reins. The mind is connected to the senses. The senses are like the horses. The wild horses at that. In the reins, the mind is connected to those senses. And the intelligence is holding the reins. And the spirit soul is going along for the ride. So when the intelligence is awake in Krishna consciousness, always heading toward Krishna, it can direct the whole thing toward Krishna. But if the intelligence is asleep or not doing its job properly, it's blind, then you've got a runaway chariot. Who knows where it'll go? Over a cliff? The mind's fixed on Krishna, the whole thing go back to Krishna. <laughs> yeah. Text 78. As long as we desire to enjoy sense gratification, we create material activities. When the living entity acts in the material field, he enjoys the senses. And while enjoying the senses, he creates another series of material activities. In this way, the living entity becomes entrapped as a conditioned soul. So first we desire to enjoy through the senses. In that desire, we create material activities. Desire gets us a gross material body, gross outer covering, that interacts with the material elements. Then when actions are taking place in the material field, enjoying the senses, a whole nother series of material activities is created. In other words, one thing leads to another. <laughs> one thing leads to another more, bigger, better. <laughs> Maybe looking at it one way is that the senses are never satisfied. That's the problem. So enjoying sense gratification, but actually the senses are never satisfied. So it always has to be more. This way, that way, another way. This kind of body, that kind of body. What is it when they're drinking the alcohol? So they have one one beer. That's not enough. Have another beer. <laughs> another beer. Before you know it, they're completely drunk. <laughs> Can't think straight at all. That's sense gratification. And that happens with all the senses. That's the problem with sense gratification. There was one potato chip company. That their advertisement was trying to sell a bag of potato chips. Bet you can't eat just one. <laughs> they knew the psychology. They built a business on it. Uh, funny thing is that that same kind of wanting more and more happens in Krishna consciousness also. When the mind and the intelligence are directing the living entity toward Krishna, you get a little bit of a taste, you want more. The difference is desiring more and more Krishna takes the living entity out of the material world altogether. 
No need for a gross material body. No need for a subtle material body. We can uh, to develop the spiritual body, which is eternal, doesn't die. And not being satisfied in Krishna consciousness is different from not being satisfied in material nature. Actually, in Krishna consciousness, fully satisfied. It's, there's no dissatisfaction with transcendental ecstasy, transcendental pleasure. There's no dissatisfaction at all, fully satisfied spiritually. And still the desire is there to go more, to go deeper. But it's not like material desire. In other words, material desire, it's never enough. It's never enough. And if there's some material gratification that's trying to go on, then there's fear and there's anxiety that it's, it's not it's gonna get taken away. <laughs> Whatever's bringing that pleasure is going to get taken away or uh, striving for it won't get it. It's never satisfied. Even, even if there is some gratification going on, it has a beginning and an end. It's the problem. But spiritually, it's so gratifying. And it's never taken away. It accumulates. It just always increases. It's always increasing. So the desire for more is there's simply the desire to increase. Whereas materially, the desire for more is because it's not satisfying anymore, and we need more, like with uh, some drugs also. People that turn to drug use, it's never enough, and they become ruined, taking more and more and more to get the same gratification, and it's never enough. Spiritually, it's always enough. It's just a matter of increasing. There's no dissatisfaction with the slightest amount of transcendental pleasure. It's a great storehouse and it's never lost. It accumulates more and more and more. It's a great treasure house. It's never exhausted. So, while in the subtle body we create many plans to enjoy sense gratification, these plans are recorded in the spool of one's mind as bija. the root of fruitive activities. In conditional life, the living entity creates a series of bodies one after another, and this is called karma bandhana. As explained in the Gita, if we act only for the satisfaction of Vishnu, there is no bondage due to material activity. But if we act otherwise, we become entrapped by one material activity after another. Under these circumstances, it is to be supposed that by thinking, feeling, and willing, we are creating a series of future material bodies. In the words of Bhakti Vinod Thakur,
The living entity falls into the ocean of karma bandhana as a result of past material activities. Instead of plunging oneself into the ocean of material activity, one should accept material activity only to maintain the body and soul together. The rest of one's time should be devoted to engaging in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. In this way, one can attain relief from the actions of material activity. So, simple living and Krishna conscious thinking. <laughs> simple living. Simple living. Accept what's necessary to remain healthy, to have the necessities of life, and different people require different necessities. Some people will require to marry and have to have a family to remain peaceful. And others may not. They may not uh, have to, to do that and they can use even more of their time. Either way, Time should be spent for maintaining oneself. It's the mode of goodness, maintenance, the mode of goodness. Shouldn't be too much involved in creating, making lots of lots of money, possessing and owning things. That's the mode of passion. And laziness and illusion and intoxication, and that's the mode of ignorance. So by situating oneself in the mode of goodness, which is the mode of maintaining, in the bulk of one's time, there will be surplus time, because you don't have to like maintain yourself 24 hours a day. Keep it simple, as simple as possible. And that's the mode of goodness, maintaining. And then the time that's left is used for hearing and chanting and serving in various ways the Lord. Text 79. You should always know that this cosmic manifestation is created maintained and annihilated by the will of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Consequently, everything within this cosmic manifestation is under the control of the Lord. To be enlightened by this perfect knowledge, one should always engage himself in the devotional service of the Lord. It's the formula for stress-free stress -free existence. And we see that the Lord is behind everything. And we're desiring to surrender to that Lord with love. And what is there to worry about? We're keeping our life simple, only endeavoring as far as necessary to maintain ourselves. And we see that the Supreme Lord is the controller of everything, the creator and the controller of everything, and everyone. So. When some difficult situation arises, it's an opportunity to remember Krishna. Self-realization, understanding oneself as Brahman or spirit soul, is very difficult in the material condition. However, if we accept devotional service of the Lord, the Lord will gradually reveal himself. In this way, the progressive devotee 
and gradually realized his spiritual position. It's his revealed knowledge. The Lord reveals himself. In this way, the progressive devotee will gradually realize his spiritual position. We cannot see anything in the darkness of night, not even our own selves. But when there is sunshine, we can see not only the sun, but everything within the world as well. Now hear, O son of Prita Arjuna, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. When we engage ourselves in the devotional service of the Lord to become Krishna conscious, we understand not only Krishna, but everything related to Krishna. In other words, through Krishna consciousness, we can understand not only Krishna and the cosmic manifestation, but also our constitutional position. In Krishna consciousness, we can understand that the entire material creation is created by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, maintained by Him, annihilated by Him, and absorbed in Him. We are also part and parcel of the Lord. Everything is under the control of the Lord, and therefore our only duty is to surrender unto the Supreme and engage in His transcendental loving service. So hearing these things from the pure devotees, whose mission is to transmit this message of Godhead. When we hear from the, the pure devotee, then we reawaken, within our heart reawakens our knowledge. Because this isn't something new. This is something that we know already as, as living entities but it's covered over. It's like a state of amnesia. This, is, this knowledge is revealing our original identity. So it's like coming out of a deep sleep or coma. Amnesia, misidentification, dreaming. When we hear from someone who's fully awake, who's fully Krishna conscious, in devotion, a loving devotional relationship with Krishna, a messenger who comes, <clears throat> when we hear about devotional service from such a devotional source, then the full potency of the Lord is there. an empowered messenger, when they speak, hearing from that pure source is non different than hearing directly from Krishna. That's what's meant by submissive oral reception. And when these messages take place, hearing from the pure representative of the Lord, the Lord is speaking through them. And our own Krishna consciousness is revived because this is knowledge that we all have. It's our reawakening coming out of the deep sleep. The 
the great sage Maitreya continued. Okay, this is a conversation within a conversation. And the Bhagavatam is like that. These topics have been discussed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And one person hears from another, and then they transmit the knowledge to someone else, who then speaks it to someone else. So originally, conversation was taking place between Sage Narada, spiritual master, and his disciple, King Prachinabharhi. That was the original conversation. We're hearing about that conversation when it is being told in another conversation. Maitreya is being questioned by the Dura. This is many thousands of years later. And Maitreya is telling the, is, is relating conversation that took place between Narada and King Prachinabharhi thousands and thousands of years earlier. He's relaying that same conversation to the Dura. They're sitting discussing these things. So this is disciplic succession. The messages are transmitted like that from spiritual master to disciple speaker who has heard, passing it on. So this is, <clears throat> now we've come forward in time. This is Maitreya continued. The supreme devotee, the great Saint Narada, thus explained to King Prachinabharhi the constitutional position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the living entity. After giving an invitation to the king, Narada Muni left to return to Siddhaloka. Went to a higher planet. Okay, purport. Prabhupada's purport. Siddhaloka and Brahmaloka are both within the same planetary system. Brahmaloka is understood to be the highest planet within this universe. And Siddhaloka is considered to be one of the satellites of Brahmaloka. The inhabitants of Siddhaloka have all the powers of yogic mysticism. Yeah, Siddhaloka. City is mystic powers. Mystic powers, mystic cities. So this is Siddhaloka. From this verse, it appears that the great sage Narada is an inhabitant of Siddhaloka, although he travels to all the planetary systems. All the residents of Siddhaloka are spacemen, and they can travel in space without mechanical help. The residents of Siddhaloka can go from one planet to another individually by virtue of their yogic perfection. After giving instructions to the great king Prachinabharhi, Narada Muni departed and also invited him to Siddhaloka. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, okay, next verse, 81. <laughs> In the presence of his ministers, the saintly king Prachinabharhi left orders for his sons to protect the citizens. He then left home and went off to undergo austerities in a holy place known as Kapila Ashram. Hmm. Now read the purport. The word prajasarga is very important in this verse. When the saintly king Prachinabharhi was induced by the great sage Narada to leave home, 
and take to the devotional service of the Lord. His sons had not yet returned from their austerities in the water. Evidently, his sons were performing austerities and had left home, and they hadn't come back yet. However, he did not wait for their return, but simply left messages to the effect that his sons were to protect <clears throat> the mass of citizens. According to Vairagava Acharya, such protection means organizing the citizens into specific divisions of four varnas and four ashrams. It was the responsibility of the royal order to see citizens were following regulative principles, the varnas and the ashrams. It is very difficult to rule citizens in a kingdom without organizing this system. To rule the mass of citizens in a state and keep them in a complete progressive order is not possible. Simply by passing laws every year in a legislative assembly. Varnashram Dharm is essentially a good government. One class of men must be intelligent, verminically qualified. Another class is trained in administrative work. Another is a mercantile or business class. And another simply in labor. These four classes of men are already there according to nature, but it's the government's duty to see that all four of these classes follow the principles of their Varna's methodology, metho methodically, excuse me. This is called abhirakshana, or protection. So it's not that someone was forced into a particular <clears throat> rung or a class of society. But by their qualifications, it, became, it would become obvious who was, had intelligence, who was inclined to study, and who, I mean, you can see that in children when they're playing. Who's the natural born leader who's having the other children lead him? He's running here, he's running there, <laughs> telling everyone what to do. I mean, it's natural. And so, to observe the natural propensities of the children, you know, who would benefit from further study, and develop their intellectual abilities for a Brahminical class, a priestly class, a guidance class, those who could give counsel and advice and study scriptures, who, who would be inclined for that. You could see that in the children as they're growing. And who liked the animals and wanted to, you know, was always like uh, interested in the plants and growing things, like gardening, and, you know, was, uh, you know, or liked to do business, you know, like this. You can see that, you can see that in the children. And then who was um, very good at just helping the others, who, you know, would do something to assist somebody else. I mean, they're all very necessary parts of society. There's nothing wrong with any of them. All necessary, they're all parts of the social body, a healthy social body. So the king is the chief administrator. He's meant to take counsel and advice from the Brahmins. And it's his service the royal family, and now his sons are taking this up, to see that the divisions of society are functioning smoothly, and that uh, there are no disturbances, and that everyone according to their natural propensity is engaged and serving nicely. And that's the idea. So it's a good system. Uh, like anything else, without good guidance, it's easily abused. So we don't see a very good example of it at the present time. And there's rigid class structure according to 
if you're born in a certain family, then you that's who you are, even if you're not qualified. But really, that's not how it works. It's according to the qualification. And it can be seen when, the ch when children are quite young. You can see who's inclined to what. And then they should be given opportunity to be trained according to their natural propensity.